What's up, everyone? It's Elijah from the Side Hustler Society, and I'm glad to be bringing y'all another episode where we're going to get into a deep dive into a topic that I think is very important for someone that has a side hustle that might be inspiring to go full time, or they might just want to keep it in a side hustle category. The one thing that I actually don't have that much experience about is maintaining a full time job while getting another side business off the ground. As y'all already know from my background, Everything I've started, a lot of it happened after I was already self-employed. So that means I had control over my schedule, control over when to pull back in terms of this project or that project without having some consistent commitment in terms of money that I had to stick to, even though I did stick to a lot of things long term. But a job is something either you're going to go in there and do it or you just got to let it go completely. With that being the case, I'm glad to be having someone that has a perspective on how to balance a side, scalable, successful business with a full-time job. Her name is Annie Yang. She has a YouTube channel. She's also a best-selling author and has a side business that's pretty successful as it pulls over 80K a year. Annie Yang is the definitive voice for millennial finance, specializing in strategies for beating today's tough economical challenges. She is the author of an award-winning, best-selling new book, The Five-Day Job Search, which helps young professionals get out of student loan debt while finding the ideal job. With more than 1 million views on YouTube, her witty approach to tough talk sets her apart from others. Annie's candid style cuts through the noise, delivering foolproof advice for real-world challenges, and far from generic tips, her focus on practical steps to quickly improve finances, especially for challenges unique to millennials. Annie complements her professional life with a love for piano, adding another layer to a multifaceted persona. So now that we've covered the bio of our guests, let's go ahead and start the show. Welcome to the Side Hustler Society podcast with your host, Elijah Bilal. This is where you can find out more about hustles that are best for you. And of course, make more money in the process. Elijah has been in the gig economy and freelance space for over five years and has done over 3,000 deliveries on Uber Eats. He's an Airbnb super host, runs multiple YouTube channels, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Anatomy of Financial Success. It's his mission to empower people with the tools needed to be successful. Now, welcome your host, the king of side hustles, Elijah Bilal. Okay, Annie, we are live. How are you doing? Wonderful, Elijah. Thanks for having me on your show today. Hey, I'm glad to have you. One thing in particular that and we've uh, talked about offline, but you had some expertise on exactly how to manage a side hustle that's a successful business that's pulling in a lot of money and a full-time job. And but that's actually an area that uh, in my audience even knows this. I don't have that much experience in. I mean, I've been self-employed for over um, six years, but um, I've learned all these different side hustles because... I was unemployed, so I could attack something fully, develop that stream of income, then maybe move on to something else. But that's not always the path that someone has to follow. Someone can develop a successful business while still having a full-time job, and maybe they want to stay on a full-time job and just keep that business thriving. That's something that you have an expertise and insight in, wouldn't you say? Yes, that's something I... Uh have an expertise in because I do still have a full-time job. Well, officially it's called a full-time job, but I really work about 15 to 20 hours a week, but I get paid the same that I was getting paid when I started working there full-time. So I basically just cut the hours, but I get paid the same and I'm still called a full-time employee according to my pay stub. <laughs> yes. Ooh, no, I, I like that. So <laughs> So it's kind of like um, your side hustle is kind of giving you the ability to take, turn a full-time job into a part-time job, but just in terms of time, your income stays the same. Am I right? Yes, that's right. You know, um, I was listening to a YouTube channel a little while back, and he has the same scenario as you. He, well, he has a YouTube channel is bringing in a lot of money, 
He also invests in real estate and he has a full time job, too, in corporate America. But he still works it. And the way he puts it is, why would I throw away free money? And I sat there and thought about like, I, I guess he's right. But wait a minute. Here's what I don't get. How is it considered free money if he's still working there? It's not free because he's paying for it with his time and his labor, isn't it? You know, um, I'm actually misquoting him. He said, why throw away money? I said free. So that's actually money. Okay. Okay. But yeah, when he put it that way, I was like, uh, he's got a point. Now, I'm not saying this is your approach, but he, he put it like this. He said, uh, they're just going to have to fire me. I was like, okay. okay. Um, but it really made me rethink the whole perspective. But we've been talking about, like, obviously, the side hustle. So some people want to know, Annie, so what is the side hustle for you that's actually caused you to be successful with bringing in money? Oh, basically, it's what I was doing at my full-time job. But then I said, why stop here? Why don't I do the same thing that I'm doing on my full-time job, but turn this into something I do for other people? So I was doing accounting for property management companies. And then there are some property management companies that don't need you to be in person full time for 40 hours. They just need someone to do like a portion of what I was doing at the full time job. So I just took I made a list of all the things I was doing at my full time job. And then I was just like, well, I could do these specific pieces and then I can offer this to clients that are doing property management. Right. Because some some property management companies, they're smaller. And they also don't have the budget to hire someone full time, but they do still need to outsource some of the tasks, right? So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, I enter bills, I pay bills, I reconcile the bank account, right? So why don't I just do this for a smaller company that needs these main things done and not all the other stuff? So that's basically what I did. I turned that into a side hustle, but then I, I grew more from there, right? Because I have a YouTube channel <laughs> where I talk about personal finance. And then at some point, I saved up enough money for a down payment for my own place, condo, that mm -hmm. I bought at 25 years old. And then I made a video about how I'm so excited to become a first time homeowner at 25 years old with no help from my parents whatsoever. And mm -hmm. it caught the eye of someone at like, you know, like Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans. Yeah. So um, they own a bunch of other subsidiary companies. So it caught the eye of someone at one of those subsidiary companies who then reached out to me and were like, Oh, we want you to make videos for us on how to become a first time home buyer. And I was like, okay, I'll take that. So now I make videos as well for them on how to become a home buyer. Um, and and it's it's nice money because I get paid five hundred dollars for like maybe a ten minute recording, and then they do all the editing. They do all of the editing and, and all that stuff. All I need to do is like I write the script. I use ChatGPT to write the script. And then I'll record like 10 minutes worth of footage in front of the camera. And then I'll upload that to my computer and then I'll send that over to them. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a powerful origin story. And I honestly think that professionals, working professionals, are sleeping on the value of just video. There are a lot of companies that will pay you for your expertise to make a video for them. Um, I mean, with me in particular, I made several videos with a publication called The Riser Guy on um, how to make uh, money with uh, Uber, Lyft, uh, Uber Eats, that kind of thing, and even some uh, personal finance videos. That actually reminds me, you mentioned your YouTube channel. Like, Feel free to shout that out for you um, audio listeners. Like, uh, what's, what's your um, YouTube channel name? Uh, YouTube channel is Annie Margarita Yang. Just search my name, and then it'll pop up. Okay. Because, yeah, I've checked out some of your videos. Um, I highly recommend y'all check her channel out. She has a lot of uh, good content, especially just on finance in general. But um, one thing that really struck me about your YouTube videos, you you cover things in a very down to earth kind of way, if that makes any sense. You yeah. I mean? yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to sugarcoat things for people and say, hey, you know, a side hustle is really easy. You can earn $4,000 <laughs> a month on the side for very little work. I'm not going right. to sell that pipe dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And uh, you also have a trade and you, you've uh, made money with it using a nine to five. But uh, ultimately, you started freelancing and that's where this business kind of evolved from, would you say? Yes, that's how I started. I actually started because um, I was working on an entry level accounting job making 45000 a year. 
And then I'm like looking at the cost of living going up in Boston. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> if they just give me like a 2% raise every year to, to match the cost of living, uh, I was like, I'm never going to get ahead financially. So I came across Ramit Sethi and he has this course. It's called How to Earn $1,000 on the Side. And the copywriting, it really spoke to me. So then I was like, eyeing this course, he's charging $1,000 for this course to learn how to earn 1000 on the side. And um, for eight weeks, I was getting emails from him every day about this course. And I was like, I'm not sure really whether I should make the jump and buy it and whether I'll find results from it. And I was reading comments from people on Reddit saying, oh, this is a shill, you know, the course, it doesn't work. The advice is really generic. And um, if you follow it, it, you won't find success or stuff like that. And then I was just like, well, should I trust people on the internet that are anonymous or should I just try it myself? So finally I jumped, I bought the course. I got on a payment plan for um, $99 a month for 12 months. So you could pay either a thousand upfront or with the payment plan, it's total 1,200, right? So mm -hmm. I, I got on a payment plan and then um, I took the course. I did like, I think, two sections a week. I, I followed all the homework. And then after eight weeks, I was able to land my first bookkeeping client and I charged a client $150 a month. So that paid for the course, basically, because it's 150 a month and the course was 99 a month. And then, you know, after I pay off the course, then all of that money belongs to me. Right. So that was nice. Got you. Okay. You know, one thing you've done that a lot of, uh, honestly, fellow freelancers overlook, they see their skill or trade as in like something that needs to be packaged all in one. And that's fine. But oftentimes, some clients may need smaller tasks done that you're capable of doing. And you come up with a price point on how to uh, service them with that. And you can have several streams of income just doing that, like using video editing, for example, like for graphic design, some people just want thumbnails, but they can make their own videos. Some people want you to master the sound. Some people want you to actually edit the video. But you know, like these are little parts of a bigger project. And we assume that, oh, this whole thing is what I need to be selling. But have a price point for the smaller pieces, too, because a lot of people just want those smaller pieces done. Yeah. And I actually think that's what you're saying is a great idea, because there are a lot of people who don't have a big budget to work with, but they still want to pay somebody to to do stuff so that they they gain their time back, right? Like for example, right now with with my side hustle business, right? Um, I don't have the funds to pay someone full time to help me with marketing. I don't, right? So um, I do have a part time employee, right? I pay her for four hours a day, every, you know, Monday to Friday. Um, but then I also dictate to her like this is how I want you to spend your time. Right. Because I don't we have a limited amount of time and I have limited funds here and this is how much I've budgeted for it. I want you to work on my website where we're going to migrate my website. That's one of the projects we're, we're working on now. And I said, I want you to spend a maximum of only one hour per day migrating the site. Right. And this is going to be a 10 week project. So then I, I already know how much this is going to cost and everything. Right. I don't need her to do everything. Right. I just need her to do specific things. And then I chart out for her, like how much time to allot for each one. Nicely put. So some people might actually be wondering in terms of your um, side hustle, how long have you um, actually been doing it? I know, I know you've been doing it since the nine to five, since you got hired, but uh, from the moment you actually decided, you know what, I'm actually gonna start taking clients on doing freelancing. How long have you actually been doing that part of business? Uh, I've been doing that since 2018. So at this point, it's been five, wait, 2024. 20, wait, six, six years. <laughs> We're still, well, I'm still getting used to the year. Sometimes I accidentally still write 2023. And it's yeah. March. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's sinking in slowly, unfortunately. But yeah. So um, how many hours a week would you say that you're putting into the business right now? Um, that's hard to say because every day it fluctuates. Like some days, like for example, recording the, the videos for that client, the home buyer videos, right? Like that's only maybe three videos a month. I'm not doing that every day. Right. Um, and not every week, certainly. So there's maybe the last week of the month, I'll record all three of those videos. So it, it fluctuates, but I would say, um, I do 
do work about eight hours a day across my full-time job and the side hustle. And then it it varies between like maybe three to four for the full-time job and then maybe another three to four for the side hustle. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So I know a lot of people are probably expecting to hear like, oh, I'm putting in like 30, 40 hours in the business. And like, it sounds like even though it's variable, the overall hours are still on the lower side. Yes. And the reason why is because my kind of side hustle, I'm not like billing per hour. It's like now it's a package, right? And then since a lot of it is accounting, it's deadline based. It's not like how much time you spend. It's more like, can you meet this deadline, right? Yeah. So actually a lot of the work I have to do is front loaded into like the first 13 days of the month <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> once, once the month ends yeah. and then I have to reconcile maybe 40, 50 bank accounts, right? So then I literally have a checklist and then I was like, okay, um, maybe I'll dedicate three hours today to reconcile these accounts. And then I literally like just go down this list and then I check mark the ones as I finish it. And then, I'll, mm -hmm. you know, once three hours is up, I might say like, okay, I'm tired. I have to stop. I would just continue this tomorrow. <laughs> right. So that's why. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess that, that does make sense since um, corporate wise, everything is done on a monthly or quarterly basis as opposed to, uh, you know, a lot of things done weekly outside that sector. So that actually does make sense. Okay. So this is probably the uh, biggest question that a lot of people have, but like, uh, what would you say is your biggest challenge that you face when it comes to balancing like a side business and a, you know, a quote unquote full-time job? I think the hardest thing is it's, it's a weird thing. I know I'm doing a lot, right and i know i'm productive i'm meeting deadlines and everything things get done for sure but then it's this weird thing in my head where i say oh, i could have done more ah I, I feel like i didn't do enough today even though like if if you compare what i'm doing to what other people are doing it's like dang any any like get so much done she's probably overworking herself right but then i feel like this guilt inside me for some reason that like oh i i could have maybe done one more task or maybe just like half of a task more, right? And it's this feeling that just never goes away. And I'm, I'm really not sure why. Um, and it, it's ambition? really difficult for me, huh? Hustler's ambition, maybe? It just I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure. Um, I actually had this conversation with my husband over the weekend and I was like, why do I feel anxious? Like, I know everything's getting done, but for some reason I feel anxiety and then i looked it up and there's such a thing it's called completion anxiety <laughs> completion anxiety <laughs> where like yeah. you feel like you have to complete something in full yeah like i had le these little oh. tasks like for example we need to repair our toilet you know the toilet's running a bit not all the time but sometimes right so that's on my list of things to do or like i i see um we need to put up the new smoke alarm so i bought the smoke alarm but we just haven't installed it yet so like it's these tiny little five minute stuff that just like add up, right? And then I look at this list and then I'm like, I'm getting anxious, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, you know what? That brings up a good mental health question that's kind of related. Uh, personally, how have you dealt with that? Like, have you done, do you have like a, a mini ritual you do to kind of get yourself out of that completion anxiety that you mentioned? Because I think that's something a lot of people don't talk about that can come up once you, I'm not even going to say leave the nine to five world. You'd still be in it. But once you start a business, it's almost like there is no finish line. Like It's not like, OK, everything is done now. There's always something that needs to be done. Always. It's just more so, OK, I've done my share for today. Now let me relax so I don't go crazy kind of thing. So do you have a ritual to kind of disperse that completion anxiety? Because I haven't heard anyone come up with a terminology for that. Well, you looked into it, but it's the first time I've heard that concept. Yeah, well, it's psychologists came up with that term. So I, I don't actually have anything. I used to um, meditate every night. That certainly helped. I don't know why I stopped. <laughs> Maybe I need to get back into it. I also used to um, go on a walk every day. So that, that helped me like walk off the stress. But like, yeah, it, it, it's cold here in Boston. 
it was getting like 25 to 30 degrees. I, I didn't want to walk. I was thinking about walking yesterday and it was blowing outside 50 miles an hour, the wind. And I was just like, no, forget Ooh. it. Right. Um, so like that habit just dropped off, even though walking is so healthy. Um, it, it's hard. It's hard. I'm sorry. I don't really have much solutions. Right. Hmm. Um, I think you've already kind of provided one. We have things that take our minds off of things. And um, to some degree, we do this just with the job, too. The only thing is the job kind of defines when we're working and then when you're off. Unless you're in some high management position, then um, that phone needs to be on 24-7, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing, you know, like it might be some people will play their PS4. Uh, some people may do nature walks, like you mentioned. Uh, some people may meditate. But I guess it's important to really have those exercises or rituals that kind of keep you, you know, get you out of that ang anxious mode and get you to just relax. It kind of serves as a pattern in a row, would you say? Yeah, I think so. And um, I think one of the things I did start doing about six months ago is I said no Saturdays, like no work on Saturdays ever. Right. Like I used to work seven days because I used to think, OK, if I work more days, seven days, you know, then I'll get more work done and um, I'll be more productive. I'll make more money. But then I, I was having health problems because I just never took off. Right. And then finally. Um, so I was doing all the right things. Right. I was getting enough sleep. I was getting the exercise, I was eating healthy, but for some reason I was still having those health problems. And then my my friend who's a therapist said, why don't you take Saturdays off and you just, you know, treat it like Sabbath, like how the Jews don't work on Saturdays. And I was like, okay, I, I'll take Saturdays off. I'll do whatever I want, guilt-free. Um, I can go to the bubble tea shop and get bubble tea. I can drink anything I want, right? I don't care. I, it can be as unhealthy as I want. It's Saturday, I get to treat myself. Um, and then after that, my health problems went away. So, you know, it, the health problems that come from balancing all of this, a full-time job and the side hustle, a lot of it isn't, isn't even about the physical, like sleep, exercise, and what you eat. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot mental. The, the stuff that are going on mentally create physical health problems. Right. Oh, nicely put. So... I would say that um, the next thing I want to ask, you've kind of kind of already gone over this, but you might want to elaborate on it. But is there a particular reason or reasons that you don't decide to go full time into the business and you know, drop the nine to five? It, yeah, it's because my husband's still a PhD student. So okay. he's a PhD student. He doesn't have a job. He earns a stipend from Boston University. Uh, anyone can look this up, how much a PhD student makes at Boston University. So he's making like 25,000 a year. Um, so I feel like just for that extra security, instead of just quitting and then going full time into the uh, side hustle, uh, once he's done, I could do that. But while I still have to support him through school, I feel like I have to stay at my full time job. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Plus, um, jobs offer benefits too. I think a lot of people forget about that part. So there are certain benefits that you could be walking away from once you do leave the nine to five world. Oh yeah, unfortunately, my job has no benefits whatsoever, so it doesn't apply to me. Yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. <laughs> so when it comes to striking the balance between the two, in terms of a scale, is there ever a point where the business may reach you might keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and if it was to threaten to take more time and it's taking time away from your job. Uh, how would you balance that out? Would you scale the business back? Would you do what you can to maintain and stop taking on additional clients? Or would you just let the business keep growing to the point to where, okay, I guess I can leave the job if I wanted to. Like, which one of those scenarios would you, uh, would you prefer? I think what I would do is I would hire somebody instead. So I would hire people to take on the little stuff that I really don't have time to do anymore at that point. Um, that stuff like, 
So the first thing I hired out was data entry. I was like, I can teach anyone how to do data entry. So I'll teach her how to do this, right? Um, so then it's it's those little things that is that are easy to teach and so routine that you don't need to do anymore, right? Uh, so that's that's basically the route I would go rather than trying to stop taking on new clients or either quitting the job. I would go for that instead because um, I'm trying to figure out a way to scale this up without eating so much of my time. So that's why right now what we're doing is, so I have this book, right? The, the five day job search. And we're making a course based on this book. So if I could sell, you know, a thousand students on this course, that's that's scalable because the course is all online and it's a video course. Maybe I'll have some coaching i'll throw in some coaching if you buy the course as well but we're we're looking for ways to make extra money not extra money but a lot of money without necessarily translating to an equal amount of time if that makes sense oh yeah that makes sense yeah we're, we're looking for ways to like make things once and we just keep earning money from that same thing that we made once it's like the gift that keeps on giving um, so for example, like one of the things I did on my YouTube channel is I reviewed AI headshots. So I put in my own business money into this. I invested it to uh, try out 20 different AI headshot services. And then I made a review of each one on my YouTube channel. And then I found the best one. And I just said, hey, guys, if you want to support my channel, I have found the best one. It's amazing. Just use my affiliate link to, to buy the headshot. And that is earning me about $700 a month with no extra work after I made the series, right? Just an affiliate income. So that's nice because I made it once. It took me about 25 hours to make that whole series, but I'm never going to have to really touch it again, honestly. Hmm, nice. Because like uh, there are things that kind of have like, there's only so many hours in a day. And with that being the case, like, like let's say consulting and you know doing what you're doing now so many hours in the day so that's going to have a natural cap on how much money you could potentially earn now you could raise your rates but you're it's still eating away your time versus developing a marketing system around a digital product of some sort whether that be a course like you said or um just something else gives you the ability to literally get paid and scale up while you're sleeping when you say Yes, that's the goal here. It's it's harder, I would say. It's much harder than just putting in the brute force of like putting in the hours and getting paid by the hour. Um, and you don't see results at first. You know, you, you plant that seed and you keep watering that seed. And you're like, I, I put in 100 hours of work into this. Why isn't it making any money, right? Um, but I mean, at some point you keep going at it and going and going and some at some point you get discovered or people start buying and then other people look at, look at you and go like, wow, why is she so lucky? <laughs> but they didn't see how many hours you put in uh, those hours where you got paid nothing for all of that, right? <laughs> so um, it's a lot of upfront work for no pay during that upfront period, but uh, it's worth it because this is what people call passive income, really. Right. I, I think... I've heard someone uh, else throw another term out. Uh, Roberto Blake likes to call it automated income. But uh, yeah, it's, st it's still the same. The end result is the money comes in from work that you've previously done before. And you get, that's a lot of work initially, like you said. But once the work is done, you just reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you did bring up your book. The uh, five day uh, job search. Do you want to tell us uh, more about like what that book is about? Even though the title says a lot, but yeah. Yeah. So basically, it's um, so there are a lot of people in our society who have credentials, the formal qualifications, and what other people consider like the right amount of experience. But so for some reason, they're not getting job offers. And you can blame the economy, you can blame all sorts of stuff, but I actually think it's because job search in itself is a skill and people don't know this skill. They might know parts of it. They might know like, oh, I know I have to write a resume or I have to have a LinkedIn profile, but they don't know all the little moving parts that go into a great resume, a great LinkedIn profile, 
um, how to interview well. It's like so many things that they have to know. So what I've done is I've broken it down and I've turned it into a system. Mm. Okay. A uh, beautiful thing about a system is it can be duplicated for each person, right? Yes, it, it is um, able to be duplicated. And um, I'm someone who, who has landed a job offer in five days for my last job. And uh, people think, oh, it's because she's lucky. It's not. It's not. Because um, I talk about how in my first accounting job search, I landed it in seven days and I thought I was lucky. And then the second time I did it in six days, I was like, wow, I'm so lucky again. And then the third time when I did it in five days, I was like, okay, third time, I think it's skill. I must be doing something right. And then I wrote this book and then I, I started teaching my friends how to do it, right? People in my own life who, who knew I wrote this book, I started teaching them and um, they started following the advice. And I had a friend land a job in 10 days as an accountant. And she, she went from making 75,000 to making 125,000. And she got, got multiple offers in those in, in that 10 day job search, right? Um, someone else, my, my friend's son-in-law was uh, laid off from his job. And then he read the book. He only followed one piece of advice from the book, which was to apply to 50 jobs a day. And while he was applying to 50 jobs a day, he was telling himself, I'm such a loser. I'm a loser. I'm a total loser, right? <laughs> I'm applying to jobs and no one's responding. But he, he got an offer in two weeks. And then um, that offer pays him double what he made at the job that he was laid off from. So actually it was a blessing for him. So a lot of people follow this system, it works. Hmm, I mean, that's impressive. And I'm just listening to the testimonials. Like uh, it's kind of redefined. Now keep in mind, I've been off the nine to five world for a while. So you can take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but um, I just never, saw job searching like that. I think I fit into the masses of the people like you just mentioned that don't see it as a skill. It's more so, well, just a standard thing that you do, just the basic stuff that you Google, then, you know, you'll get something, but you're really breaking it down and say, hey, look, this is a sequential system that you can follow to basically uh, get a job. And what I guess, Doing it the way you're doing it, would you say that there's a hesitation of, for people to actually try and get a new job because they don't know this system? Because so many people stay where they are and their income can end up being getting capped because people like budgets go to new employees all the time. Meanwhile, if you stay at your current job, unless you get some huge promotion, you're just going to get a raise every year. That's just, as you put it, 2% for staying with the rate of inflation? I think they're just comfortable. Oh. They're just comfortable. It's because like, even if you work at a toxic workplace, why do people stay? Honestly, I, I question that. Why do you even stay there? It's toxic. <laughs> it, it will literally kill you mentally and then physically. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the, there's a fear of the unknown, right? If you start looking for another job, there's the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty. What if that one doesn't work out? What if your new new coworkers also suck? And then the new company also has a toxic workplace. So at least, at the very least, if you just stay in your place where you are now, you know what you're dealing with. And if you've been dealing with it just fine, then you'll continue to deal with it just fine as well. I think that's what it is. Oh, so it sounds like at its root cause, it's a scarcity mindset. It probably is. Um, and I think there's a lot of people out there, they're capable of more, but they just don't even know they are like, you don't know what you don't know and they don't know this. So yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing. Uh, what, what propels people to take action. So I give away my personal cell phone number on my YouTube channel. So a lot of my fans, they text me and, um, mm. They, they watch my videos and then they'll text me. They're like, oh my gosh, I like yesterday's video. Um, and then, so one of them texted me. She's like, oh, I'm going to look for a new job. I was like, why? And then she said, because today, you know, I have this passive aggressive manager. And then she's <laughs> saying something and then she spat on my face by accident. And it just angered me so much, right? And uh, it, it is this specific, it's a certain anger that triggers people that gets them to like take that action. If, if the energy is not there, if that high amount of energy isn't there, people don't end up taking action. Hmm. 
But it sounds like I made something simple complicated when it's probably more simple. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's a very simple thing. It's like my mom, uh, she's an immigrant from China. She doesn't have an education beyond the sixth grade. She was a farmer and she drew water from a well, right? So very, very poor. And then she came here to the United States. And when she came here, she was earning 25 cents for every garment that she was sewing at the factory. And my dad was working for the MTA in New York City. And so, of course, my dad made more money. He was more educated and made, made more. So uh, one day my mom asks, oh, um, can we buy nicer vegetables? I'm so sick and tired of buying like the cheap vegetables that don't taste as good. And so he gives her $100 and he said, okay, here you go, $100. So she goes, takes $100 and buys nicer vegetables. But of course, because they're more expensive, she comes home with, with less food, right? Mm -hmm. Less food for that money. And he goes, you only bought this little food? She goes, yeah, I bought the nicer vegetables. And um, she didn't like his attitude. She, she was so upset and triggered by his attitude. She said, I'm never asking my husband for money ever again. I'm gonna earn my own money and he can't tell me what I can and cannot buy. I'm gonna buy any food that I want. And uh, after that, she started working for herself. She she opened an ice cream shop, a nail salon, a Chinese takeout restaurant, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and she was earning, I didn't discover till my 20s that she was earning a $200,000 a year. She was earning much more than my father. And uh, actually after that day, when she decided that she never, she never asked him for money ever again. She really didn't. Like she bought everything herself, right? And and all the stuff that we've had as kids, they were paid for 100% by my mom. And she paid the rent and everything. Whatever my dad brought in was only spent for himself. So the, the energy, this attitude that triggers people, that propels them to take action, it's actually a very powerful thing, but it sometimes it takes that initial trigger. I can see that. I think some of the best, I guess, self-employed or like business origin stories always contain like some kind of job trigger. Like my boss did something and it that was the last straw I walked out and you know, it, it always has something like that in it. <laughs> That's the common denominator. <laughs> <laughs> well, the boss said something and then walk and then you walked out. That reminded me of something that happened um at a grocery store where I used to work at. I wasn't there for it in person, but apparently someone used to work there. Um, and then the boss said something to him and he's like, that's it, I quit. And then while he was walking out, he dumped all the olive oil onto the floor and made a mess and never came back. That sounds like something you see on TV. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, oh, that's funny. No, for the record, the Side Hustler Society is not endorsing if you're gonna quit your job, that's gonna be part of your exit strategy. Just damage property. We're not endorsing it, but it, it is funny. It is funny. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the good news is, if you get Annie's book, you can switch jobs before it even gets to that point and find a job that really values you as an employee in the first place and treats you with respect. Exactly, and you can earn more money as well, right? Because that one uh, person, my son's um, friend, son-in-law, earns double what he used to make. Then my friend earned fifty thousand dollars more. So I think what people could do is they can land a new job following this advice in the book. They can earn at least ten thousand dollars more than what they're making now, and you can use that to fund your new side hustle, right? Use that to to invest in your new side hustle, or use that to to save for a down payment on a house, right? Whatever financial goals you have, use that, right? I, I think it will really benefit people. Yeah, definitely use the difference and uh, maybe not increase your lifestyle. And so so many people, when they get to making more money then their lifestyle expenses increases with that money, it's kind of like they're back where they were technically. So yeah, it is a little financial anatomy for us, right? That's right. Okay. So I'm actually kind of curious, like uh, the content in your book, would you say some of the tactics and strategies could actually help freelancers find uh, maybe their first clients or even uh, more clients if they desire? Because um, I do know there's a natural crossover sometimes between um, uh, people using tactics to find jobs 
and people using tactics to find like clients for their freelancing work. Would you say some of that could apply for freelancers too? Yes. So one of the big concepts I talk about is go big or go home. So that's why the, the one person I was talking about earlier, uh, all he followed from the book was he applied to 50 jobs a day because I say this is a numbers game, right? The, the wider the net you cast, the more likely you are to catch a fish, right? So uh, it's the same thing as a freelancer. The more people you contact, the more people you ask, hey, do, are you interested in the service that I'm offering, right? The more people you reach out to and ask, the more likely you are to find someone that says yes. Because the, the first client that I got when I was talking about, I earned $150 a month from that contract. Mm -hmm eight weeks into taking Ramit Sethi's course, I actually reached out to 500 people online. I did 500 code emails slash messages until this one guy was like, oh yeah, I'm interested. Let's meet up in person. So he happened to be in Massachusetts. So we met up in person um, and then we talked and then he said, yeah, I would like to have uh, bookkeeping done. But it took 500 before I finally got one yes. It was a, you know, but uh, what's important is you got a yes. It's not about how many had to say no to you first. It's more about the fact that you did in the end get someone to say yes. That's powerful and true. Uh, have you ever used those freelancing platforms like Fiverr or Upwork? No, I, I think it's hard to compete on those platforms because they're filled with people from other countries where they, they can you know, low ball, not low ball, because in their currency, it's a lot, but they can say, I'm willing to do this work for $15 an hour. And I'm just like $15 an hour, that's minimum wage here in Boston. <laughs> you know, I can't live on that. Um, and the kind of people on that platform, the kind of customers on that platform that it attracts are, are looking for someone who's willing to do the work for low pay. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, I'm not interested in trying to compete against that i'd rather find people that are more interested in like they they're willing to pay more money for what you bring right because like for example if i'm trying to sell accounting services like i've seen the accounting work of of those other companies that mm -hmm. charge less and they're overseas and things like that and uh the quality is very subpar like they promise amazing things they make all these big promises but then it takes a few months for the client to realize, wait a minute, they made a mistake here. Wait, there's a mistake there too. Wait a minute. I also found another mistake here too. And uh, that that's a nightmare to clean up and fix <laughs> retroactively. <laughs> they they have to ask me to clean it up and they, they're willing to pay. <laughs> right? uh -huh. um, but it, it takes them a few months to realize you kind of like get what you pay for. Right? The guy doesn't know how to do the job. I, I had a client that I ended up dropping. I, I dropped this client, but I was willing to train the new guy. And he found this guy on um, Upwork or something like that. And this oh. guy was charging $15 an hour for bookkeeping. And he is based in Kenya. So for him, $15 an hour is good money. And then for my client, I was like, are you sure about paying this guy $15 an hour to do your bookkeeping? And he said, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, I, I get to save money and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, are you sure he can do it? Yeah. 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 I'm sure he can do it. And so I'm training this guy. I've got on three different calls, one hour each training him. And mm -hmm. then like, he was kind of like asking me basic stuff. He wasn't really understanding what I was training him on. It, it, it was basically, it wasn't what I expected. It's not quality. Um, mm -hmm. And so I warned my client that I was dropping. I was like, you know, maybe I, I said, maybe a year from now, you might discover there are some mistakes with the work. He said, well, it's okay. I'm paying him so little that when it comes time to fix it, I'll pay less money to fix it than, than what I paid this guy. I, I was like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, those are not the kind of clients I want anyway. So. <laughs> well, that's the music's my ears. In my audience has heard me say this several times because um yeah i have a freelancer background and i have never used fiber upward well i've used them as a customer you know i've kind of pulled back because of what you said to be honest so you've but experienced yeah. the same thing as a customer like yeah, the quality I mean, of the work right it's like you gotta hunt so hard to quote unquote, quote unquote find someone who can actually do the job and to me that's not worth it but 
as a freelancer, I've never used them because it's kind of like going to the bargain basement in terms of rates, if we're going to be honest. And you would just do so much better to actually get out there and do what a lot of people are afraid to do. Cold call, get out and network, go to your business chamber of commerce. Y'all have meetings where you can give your 60 second pitch of who you are, what you do and how you can benefit the people there. You know, get out there and actually do the work and you'll get these clients that are willing to you know, pay you what you're worth because they have the budget to do so. And they're not bargain basement custom, uh, clients in the first place. They, they have a budget dedicated to this. It can go to you or it can go to someone else. Why not just make it you? I agree. I like that mindset. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, it, it's very powerful to hear you say that. Well, but, it's interesting um, that I'm not the only one who um, experienced that. Like the quality of the work just wasn't up to my standard. I thought maybe it was just me when oh, it no, came no. to hiring people on Upwork. Yeah. I, I have friends that have stories too. It's not just me and it's not just you. So yeah. But like you say, you, you get what you pay for. So it is what it is. Mm -hmm. For the record, I know some people are going to be like, Elijah, are you bashing Fiverr and Upwork again? They have a place. I'm just saying that I want to get y'all in the high five figures, or maybe low six figures when it comes to freelancing and you have your skill set. If you want to get to that range, you're not really going to get there using Fiverr and Upwork unless you're going to go through a lot of, uh, unless you're going to work an unreasonable set of hours, which I have no desire to do. I'm just yeah, because the platform, I think they also, is it 10% or 20%? They, they take such a their service fee. Huh? Their service fee, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was such a big cut. I was like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, the, it's such a big cut for what they're charging, right? Because really, it's, it's almost just like um what I would consider like a Tinder, but for <laughs> <laughs> freelancers and clients. Isn't it though? It's just like a, a yeah. it's almost like it's just like a matching platform. Right? Well, at least with the matching platform, if you take the relationship off the platform, which is the point, they don't mind. Fiverr and Upwork, you try and do that, they'll give you the boot as a freelancer. That's the biggest reason I never even got started with them. Because then when I finally found someone that it would work out in terms of whatever I'm trying to get, I would use them repeatedly. And uh, I would try and hey, do you want to take this off of Fiverr so you don't pay a service fee and neither do I? And they were always kind of scared to because in their terms of service, that can get them kicked off the platform and that's their only source of leads. Yeah. So yeah. That was yeah, already a turn off. I hated it. I hated it as a client because like, um, I, I just want to send like a quick email to the freelancer or something. And mm -hmm. I, I want to use my email for my phone. Right. But because I, I'm forced to use Upwork or something and be in their platform with the messaging, uh, I'd have to log into Upwork on my computer, start typing, blah, blah, blah. And then when they e uh, message back, then I get an email from Upwork saying I got a message. Click here to log in and take a look at the message. I was like, this just doesn't work in my workflow. <laughs> yeah. There's so many extra steps, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I guess we'll go ahead and move on. So this won't be labeled the anti upwork freelancer <laughs> bash uh, episode but um we actually are um, winding down because i gotta i gotta say you're a great person to interview your answers have been quick and spot on so we've actually kind of gone through most of my questions but i would i would ask that um do you have any questions you want to ask me because i always ask my guests they want to ask me any questions so do you got any you want to hear me with yeah just i want to hear more about your story and i just found it so fascinating um the introduction that you played i was like wow you know he's managing multiple youtube channels that's interesting and then I, with the screenshot of your paypal what 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 is it <laughs> what are you doing with the paypal i mean what's going on <laughs> oh oh so uh trade in terms of a freelancer yeah i'm a video editor and a website designer and uh th this it kind of goes into what i talked about as far as getting those higher tier clients and I've also uh, managed uh, some people's like YouTube channels. One of my clients was the Rideshare guy, and uh, we were able to grow his channel from 35,000 subscribers to 110 subscribers within about a year and a half. And uh, I started the podcast because uh, my origins technically come from the gig economy. I didn't used to be a PA at Amazon, but I, I quit 
it, they didn't do anything wrong. I don't want, a lot of y'all might be thinking, oh, it's Amazon. They do something crazy. No, I just got this feeling I wasn't living up to my full potential. And I had the entrepreneur skills, so that, that's just my path. But, uh, yeah, so I started driving Uber, uh, liked it, and I built a YouTube channel around Uber, Lyft, and Uber East, that kind of thing. And then I gradually, I came across a video about Roberto Blake. Not sure if you've heard of him, but he's a, like a YouTube educator. Mm. And he mentioned that start freelancing if you're broke. And then he broke down like what freelancing means and the skill sets that you can make just for writing articles if you're well informed on it, making videos, that kind of thing. I was like, okay. So I wrote down the skills that I have. Video editing, I literally have a YouTube channel I build. Let's see, writing, I know how to write articles. Let's see, website design, I've designed several websites. Well, let's go to the market and actually start making money. I did that, and here we are today. I want to pass those lessons on to my fellow people who want to have a, a side hustle, what it is to make money, or they want to go full-time. And in particular, those in the gig economy, I really want to get them out of there and get them a trader skill. I love it. This, uh, what I love about you and your story is the no nonsense part. Like you, when you talk about your story, maybe I'm not sure if it happened, but like, were you um, going like, okay, yeah, sure. I can be a freelancer and start doing gigs. But then were you having thoughts like, oh, but blah, 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 blah. Like, do you have all these other resistant thoughts as well and excuses for like why you can't do it or why you shouldn't do it? Or were you just like really no nonsense, just like you described and you're just like, yeah, I can do video editing and writing and all this stuff. Let me bring it to the market and make money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had the, you know, I, I think the term is like the inner voice in your head. That was there to a, to a certain degree. But how offset it was, I would just look at what, what have I done for my own brand? So video editing, well, here's the YouTube that YouTube channel that has been successful enough for me to monetize, as in like the YouTube monetization requires 4,000 hours of what, well, you know, it's 4,000 hours of watch time, at least 1,000 subscribers. If you can at least get monetized, you have to be doing something right. So clearly you got some quality in this regard. In terms of a writing, I wrote articles for my own website and they were getting views and traffic and there wasn't any like bad information in the comment section saying, oh man, you can't write for nothing, man. This is garbage. Like, that wasn't there. So <laughs> Why can't I go to market with this? The standards that are put out there, if I wasn't meeting them, I would be hearing bad feedback and I wasn't getting that. So the only thing that's stopping me is I didn't know. Just like you kind of said in the beginning, in terms of people doing the job search, they just may not know that maybe I should be searching for another job on a regular basis and the tactics on how to do so. So when Roberto Blake in his video hit me with that information, it just kind of clicked. So I did have an inner voice, but I guess that overrid it. And I think that's a teachable moment to a lot of people because you may be qualified, but your inner voice may talk you out of it. Don't let it. If you see that your work is the standard or better than the standard, go for it. I think that's a great mindset that you have there. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm doing my best to give people that mindset too. <laughs> so you are black, right? Like not just brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm of African descent. Yeah, I'm black. So, so why is it that you don't have that victim mentality, but instead you have this like, hey, huh, that's an interesting concept. Let me see if I can succeed with it. Like, you don't, you're not like blaming your your past ancestors. Like, this is why I'm not successful. Why, why didn't you have that? That's my question. Hmm. I think it comes down to environment, and that that's probably why I want to produce an environment where mm -hmm. people can be supported. But um, I grew up in the suburbs, and I guess you could say to some degree, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My mom is, I mean, uh, my aunt has owned a janitorial company for pretty much all my life, been very successful. She was the person that gave me my first job when I was in high school. And uh, my mom has a bachelor's in business, uh, business management. And uh, my sister's husband, he owns a restaurant. So it's like I've had all this around me so since I've seen it. It wasn't that hard for me not to visualize like me doing it too. So that there wasn't a self-esteem issue at all. So I think that played a big role in why. And uh, freelancing really is kind of the in-between between entrepreneurship and, um, and a job. 
So it's probably easier to go to being a freelancer and then from freelancer to being an entrepreneur, then to go straight from a job to an entrepreneur. That might be a it's big the bridge. Leap. It's the yeah, bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I, I find it fascinating um, every time I come across people like you, because some people they 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 tell me like oh i was born into like this inner city you know and and went to those kinds of schools um single had a single mom and things like that but then they somehow like overcame it i was like wow <laughs> you know and i just love it when i meet hosts um that like set a good example for other people basically and you're one of them oh appreciate it but since we are winding down the uh, show and if when people want to get more of you uh, where can they find you? And also, where's your book located? We will leave a link to the places she mentions. But yeah, where can they get their book and where can they get more of you? Uh, the best way to get more of me is by heading over to AnnieYangFinancial.com. That's A-N-N-I-E-Y-A-N-G Financial.com. The five-day job search audiobook is free. So if you head over to AnnieYangFinancial.com at the top, you click on the word. It's called audiobook. Put in your name or email address, and then you can download it right away. Awesome. Well, Annie, I want to thank you for being a guest on the Side Hustler Society and audience. Uh, definitely check that information out. Check her website out. Because as you can tell, she's got freelancing in her bones. I can tell. <laughs> and there's a lot of great value and information there. So we're going to go ahead and conclude this podcast. If you're listening to us on uh, Spotify, or any place where you're listening. If you can leave us a review, if that's possible, that's greatly appreciated. And on YouTube, if you can give us a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, that's greatly appreciated. We'll catch y'all in the next podcast. Be safe and be proper, everyone. This episode may be over, but your hustling journey has just started. Visit the SideHustleSociety.com to access all links and resources mentioned in the show that will help you on your hustler's journey.